Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at imagery in the Song of Songs in our continuing study, in fact, finishing up our, our study now, of the poetic books. We see images of strength, first of all, introduced uh, with a question, what kind of beloved is your beloved, O most beautiful among women? What kind of beloved is your beloved, thus that you adjure us. Uh, it's interesting that that word beloved uh, actually is the word David. Uh, very unusual as a name. Uh, and so I'm going to use uh, Michelangelo's David as sort of an image just to, to picture because I think, it, I think it does fit. The bride says, my beloved is dazzling and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. His head is like gold, pure gold. His locks are like clusters of dates and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk. You can see sort of the whites of his eyes and, and repose in their setting. Uh, his, his eyes work well in his face. In verse 13, his cheeks are like a bed of balsam, banks of sweet-scented herbs. His lips are lilies. They, they smell good. They taste good. Uh, dripping with liquid myrrh. His hands are like rods of gold. His strength here set with beryl. His abdomen is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. Verse 15, his legs are pillars of alabaster set on pedestals of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon. Uh, that is, you know, these, these great stately trees. He's great and stately. Choices the cedars. His mouth is full of sweetness. He is wholly desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now, next we turn to images of beauty where he describes her, and it's very different in some ways. Because he says, how beautiful you are, my darling, how beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. And, and there's going to be several references to veil. And we, we want to remember in that culture that when a woman went out in public, she was veiled. Your hair, she, he says, is like flocks of goats that have descended from Mount Gilead. And don't think just of a single goat, but think of a whole flock where th th there's life and it's vitality and it's sort of bouncing and... And you have this just sort of wild, wonderful hair. He goes on to say, your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewes, uh, ewe lambs, which have come up from their washing, all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost her young. No, you have all your teeth. Uh, and that wasn't necessarily given in the ancient world. Remember that, that they didn't have dentists, they didn't have, uh, uh, you know, dentures and things like that. Uh, and so this is significant. It's a sign of her beauty. He goes on to say, Your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your temples are like a slice of pomegranate behind your veil. And again, a reminder that, that most of this is imagined because what you see is just the veil until, until she becomes his bride. And so... That introduces this tower imagery. Now, the tower imagery to, to our ear just sounds strange. He, he says, your neck is like the Tower of David, built with rows of stones on which are hung a thousand shields, all round the shields of the mighty men. We get to chapter 7, verse 4. He, again, uh, he uses this tower imagery. Your neck is like a tower of ivory. Your eyes like the pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bathrabin. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which faces toward Damascus. And you say, well, that just that doesn't sound very pretty. Remember, she's like a city, and the veil acts as her walls, and no one is allowed to come in except, except her king her lover. Only he gets to go beyond the veil and see the true beauty. Everyone else sees only the walls. This is seen, for example, when we get to chapter 8, verse 8, we have a little sister, and she has no breasts. What shall we say for our little sister on the day when she's spoken for? Well, if she's a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she's a door, we will barricade her with planks of cedar. That is, she's not ready to be married. And so there comes a time when she has to take up that veil and until she's ready to meet her husband. And he will be the one who passes uh, beyond her door, as it were. 
Verse 10, I was a wall, she says, and my breasts were like towers. And then I became in his eyes as one who finds peace. He came, he came within my walls and found delight and peace there. Now there's another section that oftentimes gives us uh, confusion. That's chapter 8, verse 1, where she says to her husband, Oh, that you were like a brother to me who nursed at my mother's breast. If I found you outdoors, I would kiss you. No one would despise me either. And, and this reflects the custom of that day where you did not engage in outward displays of affection with your husband. Yes, behind closed doors. Yes, when you were in the bridal chambers, you could do that sort of thing. But in public you didn't you know you didn't hold hands you didn't do any of that but you were allowed some brief shows of affection toward your brother because after all you were brother and sister and and that would that was socially acceptable i mean nothing strange nothing weird but but you could you could make that known and she wishes she could do that with her husband you know nothing inappropriate but but at least hold his hand or or notice, I would kiss you and no one would despise me either. We get down to chapter 8, verse 6. And uh, we read, Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as, and this almost it comes out as a proverb, For love is as strong as death. Jealousy as severe as Sheol. Its flashes are flashes of fire. The very flame of the Lord. Now that last line sounds like it's, you know, got the name the word Yahweh in it, but it's not. It's uh, it's uh, Shalav Ta Yah, and that last Yah part could be translated Yahweh. Uh, but, for example, the NIV translates this a mighty flame, or King James translates this a most vehement flame. That is a a, a striking, you know, a, if you want to say a god-sized flame, uh, sort of in that sense. That that love. Love is powerful. In fact, sometimes it's so powerful, it can be described here as severe. Severe as the grave, as Sheol. He says in verse 7, Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. Notice verse Verse 6 says, love is a mighty flame. And now verse 7 says, many waters cannot quench love. The English Standard Version translates this last line, if a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. Remember, there's no it in Hebrew. You can Everything's either masculine or feminine. There's no neuter in Hebrew. Um, and so the translators of the New American Standard actually might have the right idea, but, but linguistically you can't actually say it like that. Um, and so perhaps, perhaps he's the one who would be utterly despised. In other words, there's something, there's something just a little bit, a little bit out of sorts, a little bit uncontrollable uh, when it comes to love. The the New Jerusalem Bible says, were a man to offer all his family wealth to buy love, contempt is all that he would gain. Uh, there's something uncontrollab uncontrollable about love. And there's a sense in which, in which God's love for us was such that, that it went beyond. It went, can I say it this way? It became, in a sense, uncontrollable. And I'm not saying anything bad about God. Uh, I like the way uh, Tim Keller wrote a book called The Prodigal God. The God who is lavish and, and over-lavish. The, the God who went, and I almost want to say, too far. So some lessons then from the Song of Solomon. First of all, God is concerned with all of life. Uh, with, our, with our worship, with what we do on Sunday, but also what we do on Monday through Friday and Saturday as well. Uh, God is concerned also with our sexuality. He, he created sexuality. And all of life reflects our relationship with God. That's why we could look at, at the Song of Songs and we could see analogies and we could see pictures of our relationship with Christ. Because the scriptures contain love songs. And, and I think that's a delight that God speaks to us of love. And we're part, we're part of a sacred romance. 
that romance started, it started before time began, and it reached through all eternity to touch our hearts and souls.